Okay, you can go ahead. Okay, well, welcome everyone. It's a beautiful day out there. And uh, thanks for joining us. The, um, I just wanna make sure everyone can hear. If you can't hear, raise your hand and uh, uh, Charlie will see what he can do. And uh, can everyone see the captions? The captions are live and you should be able to see them right now, okay? Uh, I wanna recognize uh, Cindy Thompson, who's our captionist today, our live captionist, and the <laughs> caption call for funding the live captioning is particularly important um, when we have a presentation that gets into any medical or technical terms because of the words that um, have to be spelled correctly. So uh, thank you very much. This morning, uh, we're starting uh, something new. Uh, we have, uh, thanks to Kara Rafinko, uh, we have uh, St. John's Meadows and Brickstone. We have a group in, in those places, uh, those living facilities uh, who are uh, participating in this. And uh, we, we welcome you. And if uh, you have any uh, comments, We'd love to have the feedback. Uh, get, the, get it to Kara and she'll get it back to us. Uh, there's, um, uh, as we work along here, if you have a question, you can raise your hand. Uh, and uh, also you can uh, qu submit the questions by the chat um, feature. Uh, and also at the end, please remember to fill out the evaluation and uh, because we'll be planning next year's programs very soon. And the valuations are very, very helpful to us to figure out what we should be doing and what you'd like to, what you'd like to have happen in the future. On those evaluation forms, feel to make suggestions of topics you'd like to hear. And uh, we'll, uh, we'll see what we can do about that. So, um, just a couple of uh, quick notes on some things that are happening uh, within the chapter. We've begun to reach out uh, more formally across Western, just got them, just getting into it. Uh, only 10% have hearing loss. And only one out of three of those people use hearing aids. I think mostly because they can't afford them. And I don't know what's happening now with over-the-counter hearing aids. And I quite honestly don't, I can't imagine using an over-the-counter hearing aid um, because I don't know how you program them. Seems to me your audiologist has a lot to do with programming the hearing aids for you. And if you have to do it yourself, um, does anybody here, does anybody want to talk to that issue Anybody in the audience have over-the-counter hearing aids that you programmed yourself? <laughs> I'm not getting any response. Okay. Wow. Next, I, next. I can jump in on that, Elise. Uh, I don't <laughs> use over-the-counter hearing aids. But I am on the uh, Hearing Aid Dispensers Advisory Board of New York State, um, and in particular on the FDA is is remiss in issuing their standard. In interesting. Um, okay, and Dan, next next slide. Uh, interestingly enough, the World Health Organization just this month, last month, released the first report on hearing loss. I mean, the first one ever. When I think of what our country has done, we have NIH with 11 different schools of thought in there, including one on hearing loss. And so what the H, what, who came out with was one in four people will have some degree of hearing loss by 2015. And at least 700 million will, will require access to hear and hearing, ear and hearing care. Um, they, they go on to say that most countries don't have hearing care integrated into the national health systems. 
And the most glaring gap is going to be in human resources. Low income countries have one ENT per million people in the population. And I, th I think we all know that the ENT doctor is not the, the one who takes care of, of, you need an audiologist and you go to an ENT person and they simply refer you to their audiologist. So I have no idea how many audiologists there are in low in third world countries, probably none. Next slide. Hearing and listening are actually different. Uh, hearing is the perception of sound. And what is sound? Can anybody tell me what is sound? I, I'm, I'm not, if, if anybody is talking, I'm not getting it. Uh, sound is pressure waves in the ear. Next slide. Okay, hearing is the perception of sound, which is pressure waves of air. Listening is paying attention and comprehending, interpreting what you hear. So hearing is where listening meets the brain. And you're gonna hear a lot about the brain through the rest of this talk because we really hear with our brain. Everything ends up in the brain. Next slide. Airwaves are converted by the cochlea into electrical neuronal impulses that travel to the brain via the auditory vestibulocochlear or eighth cranial nerve. Those are all the same nerve, different names for the same nerve. The key structure in this ver vertebral auditory system is the hair cell. And this is a chain of diverse intricate processes in the ear and the brain, which are, despite staggering complexity, hearing is effortless if you have normal hearing. With hearing loss, it becomes very effortful. And if, if you clearly understand this slide, if it makes perfect sense to you, uh, you may you may want to not listen to the rest of my talk because the rest of the talk is going to be more more details as to how this happens how the cochlea changes electrical changes airwaves which is mechan next slide okay i forgot about this slide um, please notice over over here, which is the cochlea, there's a red area and a black area. And those same areas are marked up here in the auditory cortex. And the yellow is too. The, the black area is low frequency sounds, which go to the apex of the cochlea. And this is an example of tono Topi, which we're go I'm going to talk more about later. And that word will appear on the screen. So the same frequencies here in the cochlea go to the same frequency areas in the brain. Next slide. And here, here's just a picture of the hair cells. One row of inner hair cells three rows of outer hair cells. Next. So the inner hair cells change the mechanical vibrations into electrical nerve signals. Those are connected to the afferent pathways to the brain. The outer hair cells are the cochlear am amplifier and they receive neural impulses from the brain. These are the autoacoustic emissions. So both the outer and the inner hair cells have a very definite function. 
The main function is the inner hair cells, which we have just learned can are very much affected by genetics. We didn't know that until the last few years. Next slide. Okay. Air, airways, are, which are mechanical airways, are converted by the cochlea. Is, is that the whole slide, Dan? Okay. I, th I think Charlie put um, um, transitions in here. So air, air waves are mechanical energy, are converted by the cochlea into electrical neuronal impulses. This is known as transduction, change of one kind of energy to another kind of energy. These um, impulses travel to the brain along this, the same nerve we mentioned before. And the key structure is the inner hair cell. Next slide. Two types of hearing loss. Today, I, we're talking almost entirely about sensory neural hearing loss, which is 80% of hearing loss anyway. Conductive hearing loss is anything that physically blocks or hinders the sound waves from passing through the ear or middle ear into the inner ear. Causes of sensory neural hearing loss are prolonged periods of loud noise, toxic drugs, head injuries. E Interestingly enough, even the Egyptians noticed that uh, temporal bone injuries in their warriors had something to do with hearing loss in those same people. I, th I think a talk on the history of hearing loss would be very interesting. Other causes are aging, as we well know, and now genetics. And there are mixed forms of hearing loss. Next. So one of the things we can measure in hearing is pitch, which is the frequency of the sound waves. And it says here that um, the most sensitive area is one to, to 4,000 hertz. And that, is, that should be changed to two to 5,000 hertz. Not going to talk about timber because I don't really understand it. So pitch, this is low pitch, very slow waves, and high pitch, um, rapid waves. Next slide. So while 20 to 20,000 hertz are the absolute borders of human hearing range, our hearing is most sensitive in the two to 5,000 hertz frequency range. As far as loudness concern, is concerned, we, we can hear starting at zero decibels. Hearing, loudness is measured in decibels. Um, and we, it's known that sounds large, more than 85 decibels can be dangerous for your hearing. And many of us have decibel meters on our smartphones. And if, if you've ever measured the um, decibels in a sports stadium, I mean, they go well over 100 and you're in there for hours. Next slide. So on an audiogram, the two measurable qualities of sound are pitch, which is measured in hertz, named after the German physicist who figured out how they work, and loudness, measured in decibels along this side of the audiogram. Frequency is measured across the top, and we measure from 125 to 8,000, although the, the most sensitive area is 2 to 5,000. I, next slide. Yeah, I, I, I left out one slide 
showing many, many different animals. Most animals can hear a much wider range of sounds than we can. And I, I've included this slide to show to the ladies that a hair dryer is often measured at 80 decibels. And you're pointing that thing right into your ear. At least I do. It's louder than a vacuum cleaner. Normal conversation is about 60 decibels. Uh, next slide. Okay, this is, this is a, shows the different ranges of hearing loss and you, you can find this any place yourselves. So I'm not gonna talk about that. Next slide. Three, when we talk about the anatomy of the ear, I'm sure you all know there are three parts to the ear. The external ear, the concha or pinna, and the folds in that ear are, everybody has a di different folds out here. And this, the auditory canal, which is lined by epithelium, ends up at the tympanic membrane. And that's the external ear. And this is, this is a desert fox who likes to sleep in the sun, but he has large ears to accommodate his increased hearing. Next slide. The middle ear contains the three tiniest bones in the body. This is a, a Roosevelt dime. And those are the, the ossicles next to the dime. You can see how tiny they are. Um, if the sound coming in needs to be increased, the, the bones tap, they, they can tap more rapidly and they have to drive the air, the airways in from a air filled space into a fluid filled space. Because the middle ear has fluid. Next slide. Okay, I forgot about this. Um, the, the middle ear is open to the outside via u, the eustachian tube. And that's, that's what we use when you've been flying and the airplane goes down and the pressure builds up in your middle oh, ear. Oh dear. <laughs> I, I, have to, I, I have to turn my dog off. Uh, maybe I'll let her out. I'll be right back. It's always fascinating when this happens on network TV. This was a planned intermission. Yeah, right. Um, I'm, I just want to tell folks we're not going to have a pop quiz after this lecture, so you can relax a little. <laughs> so, sorry about that, but it's a small dog, but it's very noisy when it gets going. So the the eustachian tube is also useful when when you're if you have an upper respiratory infection and you your ears get plugged and it can help then too. Next slide. This, this is the cochlea. These are the, the vestibules which have to do with balance and the cochlea is the main part of our auditory system. And th this is these are the, this is why it's called the vestibulocochlear nerve because it runs from the vestibules which have nothing to do with hearing and it runs from the cochlea. And it is the eighth cranial nerve. Next slide. Okay, th this is a, 
really good video. It's a med L, a, a cochlear implant. It's an ad for them. And it, I think it explains hearing very well. Ears are constantly active. They pick up sound waves and change them into information that the brain can interpret, such as music or speech. Sound is a pressure wave that can vibrate either quickly or slowly. Slow vibrations produce deep sounds, while quick vibrations produce high-pitched sounds. Sound enters the ear and is directed through the ear canal, where it first reaches the eardrum. As the eardrum begins to vibrate, it sets the ossicular chain in motion. The ossicular chain consists of the hammer, anvil, and the stirrup. Sound vibrations move along the ossicular chain and into the inner ear. Within the inner ear, the cochlea plays a central role. It is here that the mechanical energy of sound is converted into complex electrical signals, which are then passed on to the brain. In simplified terms, the cochlea is a spiral-shaped tube filled with fluid. Sensory cells, also called hair cells, line the entire length of the cochlea. These hair cells have varying degrees of sensitivity for the detection of different tones or frequencies. This allows the ear to perceive the entire spectrum of sound. The change from mechanical vibration to electrical pulse is a complex process resulting from the movement of hair cells in the cochlea. Along the entire length of the cochlea, the hair cells are arranged like the keys of a piano. Hair cells located at the base or lower region of the cochlea are responsible for high frequency, while hair cells at the apex are responsible for the low frequencies. As the fluid in the cochlea is set in motion, it causes a corresponding movement of the fine structures on the surface of the hair cells to take place. These movements cause tension differences which produce electrical signals that are passed along the hearing nerve to the brain. The auditory cortex of the brain interprets this information as sound, for example as music or speech. The entire chain of events, including the various steps that convert sound waves from the environment into information that the brain can interpret, happens so fast that individuals can hear sound both continuously and instantaneously. Within this complex chain of events, there are a number of factors which can cause an individual to experience hearing loss. A loss of hearing can range from a mild to moderate hearing deficiency to a total hearing loss. In general, there are three main types of hearing loss which differ from one another depending on the part of the ear that is affected, be it the outer, middle, or inner ear. Okay, ne next slide. Okay, here, here is a drawing, an artist's drawing of a cross-section of the cochlea. There are two large fluid-filled chambers and a smaller central chamber. And the, the smaller chamber is the spiral organ of cordy um, in, in the cochlear duct. And these, the two large scala are filled with perilymph fluid from the blood vessels or the cerebrospinal fluid. And the ne next slide is shows it better. Okay, this, this shows the same three chambers, but the scala media is in green. And this chamber contains endolymph instead of perilymph and endolymph has a different chemical constituency the scala media is rich in potassium ions versus these which are 
do not contain potassium. potassium. This is the tectorial membrane, and it was shown in that video, it was green. And it, it slides across the top of the cilia of the inner hair cells, sort of like a windshield wiper. So you can imagine this going back and forth across the top. And that next slide, oh, this is an even more detailed picture. The tectorial membrane slides across. The, these are the hair cells on the basement membrane. And this is all part of the organ of Corti. Corti was an Italian in, in the 19th century who studied hearing loss. So the next, next slide. OK, this shows the cochlea unfold, rolled out, opened up and rolled out. Now, <laughs> where did that come from? OK, the, um, the high, high frequencies, wait a, wait a minute. High frequencies are located at the base of the cochlea. And low frequencies are at the apex. And up, up here, we have the different frequencies in numbers, in hertz. So 25 hertz, very low frequency at the apex of the cochlea. And th this is known as tonotopic frequency arrangement. And next, next slide. I, I don't know what this bar across the center is. Yeah, at least we're working on it. It's something that's happening within Zoom. Well, OK, the, this is an example of tonotopy. Uh, as you notice, as the cochlea goes up, it changes colors. And those colors represent the, the frequencies. So the low pitched goes to the apex. And high pitch goes out here at the base of the cochlea. And this, I think tonotopy is very difficult to understand. You, you can look up the word. And I'm, I'm looking through my notes right now to see what I wrote down about it this morning. Elise, can, is, I, can I interrupt you? We're going to try something to get rid of that. Dan, if you can hear me temporarily get out of screen sharing and then go back in again. It should pick up where you left off. Now you're going to have to find it. Oh, resume. Hey. <laughs> I, I think uh, Charles Johnstone is a master of technology. <laughs> he, he, he knows everything on PowerPoint. We could take a lot of lessons from him. <laughs> so tonotopy refers, next, next slide, refers to the spatial arrangement of frequencies in the cochlea along the organ of Cordy. And I've just shown you those in the in the the organ of Cordy, and the same frequencies are in the brain. And unless those sound waves go from from the cochlea to the exact same area in the brain, you will not hear them. So. Spatial layout of frequencies in the cochlea along the organ of Corti is repeated in the primary auditory cortex. Uh, next, next slide. 
Oh, and this, this shows what happens when those, when the, the these are what, what happens. This is the beginning of the cochlea. Um, the tip links change. They, they shift when the tectorial membrane runs across the top of them, and they release potassium into the cells, into the hair cells, which depolarizes the hair cells. And the next slide. So now we have the syn synapse between the neurons, and we have these audit. We have these sensory vesicles in here, which are released by the depolariz depolarization of the cell. And next slide. Oh my God! I forgot about that. Next slide. Well. And, and then um, when that happens, the, the cells are depolarized and sound goes from the cochlea to the brain. And I, I cannot detail all the areas in the brain that it goes to. I mean, it goes to 12 or 13 different locations, starting in the, the, mid, the midbrain, and through different synapses, through different reference points, and it, it crosses from, from one side to the other. And it, so you can see that this is all about the brain. And let's see what it says over here. Solid colored lines show the ascending pathways to the primary auditory cortex. So the sounds are going from the cochlea up to the brain, and descending connections are represented by broken lines. I, I hardly, I, okay, here's one broken line. Next slide. I, another picture of what's going on from the cochlea. Uh, these look like they're all going up. The first relay station, there are 30,000 nerve fibers in each auditory nerve. And each fiber carries a particular frequency and loudness of sound, depending on its origin and the, and the organ of cordy. So this, this represents tonot tonotopy. Each fiber carries a particular frequency, and this is and loudness of sound. It goes through 13 central areas, including the olivary nuclei, the colliculus, the lemniscus. I can't name all the centers it goes to. And no, nobody seems to pay much attention to the brain. I think a neuropathologist would be able to tell you all these different areas. Each center responds best to a, to the, a different type of information. Next slide. The auditory cortex, the primary audit, auditory cortex is here in the temporal lobe. There are other central areas that refer from here to here. And the next slide. Auditory sensations reach perception only if they are received and processed in the cortex. And the cortex is divided into three parts, primary, secondary, and tertiary. Damage to the primary cortex leads to loss of any awareness of sound. But the ability to react reflexly, reflexively to sound remains due to subcortical processing in the auditory brainstem. So you can react, you can jump if you hear a loud sound, but you can't hear any speech. Next. 
Okay, this this demonstrates the different auditory brain centers. And you actually get different types of hearing loss according to where the damage in the brain is. And Broca's area is here in the left frontal lobe. And this, if you destroy this area, you end up with a motor aphasia. The, the patient understands, but they cannot articulate anything. Wernicke's is an aphasia affecting this part of the brain in the temporal lobe. And these people can speak, but they speak nonsense. They, there's a lack of comprehension. This is called a receptive aphasia versus a motor aphasia. Next slide. The brain needs to encode and decode incoming sound signals uh, in, in loudness and frequency. This requires many neurons working together. Again, the neurons are tuned to respond to certain frequencies. Uh, forget the rest of this. Uh, next slide. There is feedback inhibition. If there's too much noise coming up to the brain, the brain wires down to the cochlea and says, turn it down. It's too loud. Turn down the amplifiers. And I think that's the last slide. Oh, just one more picture of normal three rows of outer hair cells one row of inner hair cells, and you can see a, a lot. these hair cells are not nice and regular, and the outer cells, mo many of them are missing, so they all get damaged. I think that's the last slide. Okay, I, I wanted to point this out. This is from a meeting that many of us went to uh, in 2016 or so. Uh, as we well know, hearing is vital to communication, health function, and quality of life. Hearing health care involves, involves a wide range of services and technologies. And this is the main thing I wanted to point out here. Hearing loss is a public health and societal concern. Engagement and action are needed across the spectrum of relevant stakeholders. And I want you to know that the public health department at the University of Rochester does not accept this. Uh, I, I've been to one of their meetings and they simply do not accept hearing loss as a public health concern. They never talk about it in their meetings, and Ann Dozier is the chief of the public health department at the University of Rochester, and I think the Hearing Loss Association needs to go after her. Her, her name does not appear here. It's A-N-N-D-O-Z-I-E-R. And I think she needs to con hear from us. I think that that is the last slide. I, I any, any questions? Well, I, I've probably lost everybody. I think that's a very confusing talk. And well, Elise, if I can say anything, I think it was fantastic. Your homework and your research, you would think that you were a professional audiologist. And here you're a professional pathologist. And I, I thought your, your presentation and your preparation was absolutely outstanding. You really <laughs> did your homework. Yes. Um, as I met, someone said, they, th they thought that today that those of us with a hearing loss and those of us involved with HLAA would probably understand 
a good deal of what you were saying. And possibly our visitors or our new attendees, possibly from Brickstone and the Meadows, maybe they had a little bit more of a challenge. But I hope that the Kara Rusenko will talk with the people who are watching this and will get their input. It would be very valuable information. I see that Charlie from North Shore, do you, oh no, the, okay. Who has a comment or a question? I think you're all in awe of what you've just heard. Anyone raising their hand? Yes, Eileen, Eileen, yes. And then Barb Rice. Eileen, please unmute yourself so we can all hear what you have to say. Um, Elise, I just I just love the presentation. I thought it was great and I did learn a lot. And I would like you to repeat the name of the um, department that Ann Dozier is the head of. <laughs> The Department of Public Health. Okay. And um, the other thing is, could you say a little bit more about what they've found out about what is hereditary um, in the hair cells in the cochlea? You said one of them is, her, they've de determined is genetic more, more genetically determined than the other? I, I don't think we've attached a specific type of hearing loss to a specific genetic imperfection. And that is all very new. And all I think all we know is that there are genetics involved. We, we didn't know that until quite recently. And there, there is a researcher at the U of R, Dr. Pa Patricia White. Uh, and she presented at the symposium, the hearing loss um, symposium in Rochester a couple of years ago. And I, I think she would be glad to give a talk sometime about genetics and hearing loss. I'm sure she would, if she's still there and not away someplace on a sabbatical. Right, right. Well, I found your talk very exciting. Oh, and, it, and it did fill in a lot of gaps um, in my knowledge base. And I really appreciate your time. Well, thank you. OK, Barbara Rice, did you have a question? Uh, not a question. I just wanted to tell her that I think it was an excellent presentation. And we, uh, we could all learn a lot. It was uh, for people who had never uh, had a presentation at all about how the ear works and everything, might have had a little trouble following because it went pretty fast. But I think for most of us and our, where we are in our uh, HLAA, we are more acquainted with that sort of thing. So I think it would be good. For, it was good for us. I think we really learned a lot from that. Thank you, Elise. Thank you. So <laughs> well, you're quite welcome. It's, it's a very complicated topic. And it, it took me a long time to even begin to understand it. And I, I started doing this about 10 years ago, maybe 12 years ago. And at that point, I I had to go to places like MIT um, programs to to learn anything. And now every Tom, Dick, and Harry has a video on hearing loss on YouTube. I mean, in with all, every kind of accent you can ever hope to find. I have difficulty hearing people with accents other than an American accent. E even on PBS, did you listen to PBS News? Laura Trevelyan, I mean, she has such a thick British accent. I, can't, I don't even know she's talking the same language. Well, she's talking <laughs> British and I'm, we're talking American. And they are, they are quite different. 
Okay, okay, Kara, good. I'm glad. And then Barbara Gibson, first Kara, and then Barbara Gibson. Kara, yes. Are you able to remove your mask so we can see your face? <laughs> I shouldn't, but I think I'm far enough from um, some of the residents sitting here. But okay. um, one of the residents um, was asking if Elise could comment on ringing in the ears. I I could I didn't get what your question. She's wondering if you can talk about ringing in the ears. One of the uh, residents watching from uh, where Kara is is asking if you can talk about ringing in your ears. Tin tinnitus. Now that that is a whole other subject, and I I won't even begin to talk about that. <laughs> Because, well, because I really don't know what the current concept is, but it's very common. E even people who don't have hearing loss may have tinnitus, and it is a harbinger of hearing loss to come. Okay, maybe we can have a program. We'll have a presenter, Kara, and someone who's just speaking about tinnitus. Um, thank you for your question. And Barbara Gibson, you're next, and then Bruce Nelson. I wanted to say that I uh, enjoyed this talk very much, too. I like the uh, intense scientific basis for everything that's happening and learning how it's going on. Um, but I wanted to ask, as far as getting in, in touch with the Department of Health, um, especially in these times when we have a really deadly pandemic going on. What do you think that our local Department of Health should start by doing in regard to hearing loss? Uh, it, it's the Department of Health at the U University of Rochester oh. that I'm talking about. Um, not, not the Monroe County Department of Health. We, we even had Dr. Mendoza, who is the head of the Monroe County Department of Health, come and speak at Osher, where I go. And I, I think he recognizes health, hearing loss as a health topic. It's just the University of Rochester that does not and I think they're a pretty important service. And I, I just think may, maybe Art Maurer would like to contact them, tell them a bit about us. I, I went to one of their sessions. A, a medical school classmate of mine came up and he, he talked about, I, I don't even remember what he talked about, but they had no captions. They had nothing. And I, I spoke up afterwards, and I got nowhere with Ann Dozier. and <laughs> made, made me very angry. Thank you. OK, Bruce, and uh, then other people be thinking of a good question or comment. Bruce? Yeah, that, yeah it's really uh, fantastic to uh, talk. Uh, it goes to show that there's more things that can go wrong between that sounds on the outside to your brain actually processing everything. There's a lot more pathways and things going on that you haven't thought through one. And it's really fantastic that it all works together. When it, and when it works well, it works really well. And when one <laughs> little thing goes bad, you're in trouble. Yeah. <laughs> you know, out of curiosity, and when you were talking about genetics, and when I was in high school, I, the question was asked, is hearing loss hereditary? And I said, yes, and they marked it wrong. And out of curiosity, can you just raise your hand if you think you might have a genetic hearing loss? Interesting. Not as many people are raising their hand as I would think. OK. Who else has a question or a comment? Eric, do you? Or Pin? Pin, yeah. Pin or Eric and then Pin. Yeah, I, I just uh, observed that uh, the federal government uh, had a commission going uh, to decide uh, whether or not uh, PCPs 
uh, should be testing people after a certain age. And the answer was, nah, it's not important. So that's consistent with with uh, what we've got going on at the University of Rochester. This is really something that uh, I think HLA, HLAA National should be and is uh, going after. Uh, and it's been noted that the insurance industry is uh, of course res you know resisting a lot of this and trying to influence these commissions because they 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 don't want a situation where they have to help a majority of people in this country yes good point pin and we yes. only is seven twelve fifty seven and we only have about one minute left so this is the last comment before we go back to our president art mauer uh, I just like to comment on this business of auditory channels versus uh, visual channel. Uh, as, as is not well known, the video channel encompasses a, a very wide frequency range as compared to the five or 20,000 hertz uh, uh, audio channel. And yet, the, the little bit of um, frequency space the audio channel carries uh, is extremely important. And most, uh, I, I was at Kodak and I was always struck by the, by the um, importance that the audio, band, uh, audio bandwidth uh, has an effect on us way out portion to its its bandwidth. So, so it is a very important thing. A lot of people who produces, uh, for example, a video program, uh, they have lousy acoustics, and they are losing out big time. Uh, and and I think sound is a very important resources in our entire body. Uh, and it is um, really way out of, uh, it, it's a really a cheap way to get a lot of information across and pleasure too. Look at the, mu look at the music that you can produce with a 10, 20,000 hertz of uh, bandwidth. That's all I want to say. Well, thank you, Pin. Yes, yeah. okay, it is 12.59 and we go at... One o'clock, we adjourn. So, Mr. President, what are your closing comments? Well, I just, I, first of all, at least I want to thank you for an excellent presentation. Every time mm -hmm. I go through this type of presentation, I am absolutely amazed at how complex our hearing is between our ear and our brain and that interplay. And we've come up with a new tagline that fundamentally puts it in one line. It says, better hearing equals better living. If you turn that around, poor hearing equals degraded living. It has an effect on how we live. We have to be able to clearly hear. What scares me is as we look at the future and over-the-counter stuff, most people have no idea of how complex this is. I certainly didn't before I got involved with HLAA. And most people don't know that. And over-the-counter, I think, is going to be a very difficult time for people to sort things out. So we've got our work cut out for us. I just want to say that um, next month, uh, we're going to have a visitor that will talk on some things that are being done with hospital stays in Chicago to be able to communicate better when you're in the hospital. So you may find that of interest. And we are beginning to, to, to put some real focus on in the hospital. Eileen, uh, helped us put together with the uh, Education Outreach Committee a communications guide for when you go to the doctor's office. Uh, and that was published about two months ago. And uh, it's on the website if you go look at it. Uh, and, and it's a one-page document. But now we want to tackle what happens when you're in the hospital. So, uh, and that's a very complex problem also with all the people that come and go. And so I thank you all for coming. Please, uh, 
those of you regulars uh, send the evaluation form to Carol Bradshaw. And those of you folks at, a, at Brickstone and St. John's Meadows, I hope you enjoyed this and I hope you come back again and uh, let Karen know what you like and you don't like and what you like to see. We're very flexible over here. So thank you very much. Okay, folks, I'm going to stop the recording, but I will leave the meeting running if uh, people want to chat amongst themselves. And uh, Cindy, thank you for your service. You did a fantastic job with all of that terminology. <laughs>